Hello from the Forstronics YouTube channel. Welcome to how to build a lithium ion and USB powered design with built in charging. And this is the last part, part four. Before we jump in, I'll just mention Forstronics now has a Patreon page. You can see the link below. Please check it out if you like my content. And at the end of this video, after we go through all the content in this video, then I'm going to give a quick two minute commercial on the Patreon page if you're interested. All right, let's get started. So here's the block diagram of the, our design that I've been talking about through the first three parts. And in part two and three, we looked in detail of the circuit designs for each one of these blocks. We looked at the schematic, the part selection, and why we chose certain parts. So in part four, we're going to look at the PCB layout with a larger focus on the voltage regulator circuit since it is sensitive to PCB layout. Then we're going to demonstrate the circuits in action briefly. And then we're going to look at some example measurements of the output power supply, looking at the noise. And then finally, I'll share the bomb and then the Patreon commercial. So just so you know, for this video series, I've been using this design as my example. And in fact, for my last couple video series, I've been using this design. So this is the Forstronics ESP32 development board. And I did this just to get a better feel of how to design with the ESP32 and also to use for some fun hobby projects. But this is what I'm this is what our circuits that I've been showing are on and this is what I'll use to demonstrate the circuits, right? You can see the battery connector, you can see the USB type C connector. This is our isolation diode that isolates VDD from the VCC input to the regulator. This is the regulator circuit. This is the battery charging circuit. And so we'll look at those in the PCB layout. Okay, so here we're back at the data sheet for the boost regulator, the TSP61 whatever boost regulator from Texas Instrument. So most switch mode regulators will have a section of the data sheet that talks about layout because layout can be critical. And the reason layout is important because it affects the stability of the output, it affects the noise on the output, and also affects what type of EMI the design might put out. And so EMI stands for electromagnetic interference. And it's when your power switching circuit emits RF energy that could affect other parts of your design or other designs around it. But the gist of doing the layouts is having wide traces for the power input as well as the power output, and also having critical capacitors and inductors that are part of the power signal path and part of the power conversion close to the regulator or switching IC as possible. So if you take the top here in dark gray, this is our path for our power. This is a nice wide trace. They call it VBAT. For us, it would be VCC, which could be USB or the battery, but they have a nice wide trace. Why do they have a nice wide trace? Because they're trying to reduce parasitic resistance and parasitic inductance, and to a lesser extent, parasitic capacitance that are in the PCB traces. So having this wide trace reduces the resistance and the inductance. And the idea here is the capacitor, the input capacitor is as close to the input of the IC as possible. Same with the inductor and same with our output capacitors. This one has two out capacitors, C2 and C4. C3 is the VOX capacitor. You want as little parasitic resistance between these capacitors, inductors, and the switching circuit because that resistance not only does it burn off power and reduce your efficiency, but also can affect the charge and discharge times of the capacitor and how the inductor pumps current into the capacitors. So we did all this effort to calculate the best components. What we don't want is parasitic effects of the PCB to change or affect our calculation. So that's what we're trying to prevent here. The other thing you have to be careful about is ground. And notice this IC, not only does it have ground pins, but it also has a ground pad on the bottom. So I just jumped from the layout guidelines back to the typical application example in the data sheet. And I wanna use this to make the points about what I started saying about the ground. You wanna have a nice ground plane for your regulator circuit, not only to handle the flow of currents in the ground plane, but also to dissipate heat that's generated from the IC. 
The switching regulator creates a lot of noise, and that noise is not only in the traces, but it's also in the ground plane. Remember, for current to flow, it has to have a complete path, and that second part of that path is the ground plane. But notice in this typical diagram, they have two type of ground symbols. They have this fork looking symbol, and then they have the standard ground symbol. And a lot of the power related pins or circuits, like the output capacitor, are tied to this fork ground, which I'll call power ground. And then the rest of the design's ground is this standard ground symbol. And the idea is they want you to try to isolate the grounds. And that doesn't mean totally isolate them so they're not connected, but it means connect them at one point or two points and leave most of the power ground isolated so you isolate that noise from the rest of the ground plane so it doesn't affect other circuits in your design. We're looking at the schematic for the regulator circuit that I shared in part two. What I wanted to show you though is I have this PE ground and then over here I have this regular ground, right? So this is what we were just looking at in the data sheet. PE ground is my power ground. This regular ground is the ground for the rest of the design. And so what I do at the bottom here is I use these SHs, which are shorts, to create two points where the grounds connect so I can isolate the power ground to help keep that ground noise around this circuit and not in the other parts of my ground plane. Okay, here's the PCB for the full ESP32 development board. And I'm not gonna go into all the details of PCB layout, but the idea here is this is a two layer board. The red parts, the red signal traces and the red ground plane represent the top of the board and the blue ground plane and the blue signals represent the bottom. For this design, all the components are on top so the bottom is only used for an additional ground plane as well as for routing signals. These green things called vias are often used to transport one signal from the top layer to the bottom layer. So here on the left is my USB connector where my power comes in from USB and then down here J3 is my battery connector where, where power comes in from the battery. So here I just zoomed in on the boost regulator circuit. Here on the left is the isolation diode that isolates the USB's VDD bus from the VCC bus. And remember, the VCC bus is what's fed into the input of the regulator that the USB power and the battery share. Notice that this big red chunk is all the input trace, right? So I'm following the data sheet's guidelines to have a big input trace to reduce parasitic elements in the PCB trace. And notice C2, that's my input capacitor. And notice how I have that right up against U3, which is my regulator IC. Then L1, which is up here, that's also right against the regulator IC, trying to keep those signal paths as short as possible. And then the output comes to C3, which is my output capacitor. Once again, notice the output, a big fat trace. C1 is the Vox capacitor. Then this chunk here, this red chunk that flows through the IC to this other side, that's PE, that's my power ground. Also this piece over here is part of the power ground. And then the blue section underneath here, that's all part of the bottom layer power ground. And then I have v vias tying the ground planes together. Now notice I put vias right on the pad of the IC. And so you can better see this, let me remove the ground plane. So now we're looking at a view where you can only see the traces of the, the polygons and the ground plane. And so notice here is the IC. You can notice it has this big pad on the bottom for a ground connection, but it also uses this to dissipate heat. So what I like to do is I like to put vias right on the pad and those vias go through the board and they connect to the bottom ground plane the power ground plane. And that helps the chip dissipate heat through the top layer to the bottom layer. Now, when I do this, my PCB software always throws up an error saying, you know, you, you, know, you have vias overlapping on your pad, but I intentionally do that. That's one trick that I found that works well for transferring heat from the top to the bottom so it can dissipate better. Also, when I have the ground plane not shown, we can see our shorts that I showed you in the schematic. So I have two connection points. A lot of times they only do one connection point. I'm gonna do two, but I put them both on the bottom. This square right here is what connects my power ground to the rest of the ground for the design and same over here. And the idea is I put the shorts on the bottom 
so that all the noise on the top layer ground can only flow to the bottom to get connected to the main ground plane to be returned to whatever the main power source is, USB or the battery, right? Because current flows in the ground plane. And the idea here is by isolating the top layer totally, I'm sort of protecting the other ground plane around the regulator from getting noise in it. Now, of course, noise can travel from the bottom ground plane up to the top one, but this is a pretty good way to isolate it. Here I've added the ground plane back and I've zoomed in to some of the battery circuits on the PCB layout. So here's J3 is the connector. C16 is the 10 microfarad capacitor that's right on the same node as the battery and it helps keep a stable voltage at the battery. So when the charging IC, which is over here, is monitoring it, it's monitoring a stable voltage. Q17 is our P-channel MOSFET that the charging IC uses as a variable resistor, right? It controls the gate, which controls you know, how much the MOSFET is turned on, and then it pumps current through there based on the charge state of the battery. And then of course, this diode is used just to isolate the battery from the charge circuit when it's not charging it. And then of course, the battery charging circuit is powered by VDD, which is the bus from the USB input. Once USB is not connected, then the charging circuit gets no power, so therefore the battery will not charge unless we have USB power connected. Q5 is the P-channel MOSFET that isolates the battery from VCC when the USB is connected. So if we scroll over, we can see the gate is connected to VDD, right? So this is a top layer trace that goes to a bottom layer. And so once USB is connected, this MOSFET acts like a switch and opens to isolate the battery from the VCC input. So let's look at a video that shows this design and our circuits that we've been covering in action. Okay, here we're looking at the Forstronics ESP32 development board. We just, have, we just have a lithium ion cell connected to it right now, so that's the only thing powering it. And I have a simple program running on this ESP32 that's just gonna cycle through different colors on this RGB LED. So here the LED is running, the program's running, and it's being powered by the battery. But now I'm gonna plug in USB power while the program's running. So I just paused the video. Notice what happened. First of all, the program wasn't disrupted, right? The ESP32 got continual power during that. But now the circuit is running off USB power. And since the circuit had been running for a while off battery power, the battery is no longer fully charged. So once USB was plugged in, the MOSFET isolated VCC from the battery. And so USB powered the regulator without any disruption in power. Now our charging circuit has power, so it finds out, hey, this battery's not fully charged. I better start charging it. And that's why this light's on. Now, as I let the video run, we're gonna do the opposite thing, right? We're gonna remove USB power and switch back to battery power. And there we go. And we can see the software's still running. Nothing was disrupted. So that was the goal of this design in this video series was to create a way to power a design, a load, using either USB power or battery power and to be able to seamlessly switch from each of those power sources and to create a regulator that's highly efficient to run off the battery and to have a charging circuit to charge our battery. Okay, let's look at some example measurements of the output of our voltage regulator. Okay, hopefully you're familiar with an instrument called an oscilloscope. It's a way to look at voltage or in some cases current in the time domain. So on the y-axis we have amplitude or voltage and on the x-axis we have time. So right now we're looking at one volt per division. Here's our ground point. So one, two, three, four, five. We can see about five volts. So I'm using a probe that's connected to the output capacitor of my circuit to measure the direct output of the boost regulator. And here we see a five volt DC level, but you can notice there's a ripple on it, right? That's one of the downsides we talked about in part one is switching regulators are highly efficient. That's why they're used in a lot of designs, but the downside is a noisy output. So here I zoomed in. I zoomed in 20 times from one volt per division to 50 millivolts per division. So now we can see that ripple up much closer. And we can kind of see two different noise signals. We see 
these markers are making a measurement. So it's showing about 51 kilohertz, this triangle signal that we zoomed in on. Now this signal is about 100 millivolts peak to peak, which is pretty standard for switching regulators as far as noise at this low power level. Now, when, when you ever you test the stability or the noise on a switching regulator, you always want to do it under full load conditions. So right now I have it set up to draw about 500 milliamps, which is almost full load conditions, because that's when you're going to get the max noise. So here we can see a, about a 51 kilohertz signal. This is most likely from the current pumping and charging of the capacitor under this type of load condition. Under different load conditions, the frequency of this noise may change. So if we go from here, you can see these little spikes on one side of the triangle waveform noise. Here I zoomed in on those spikes. Experience tells me those spikes are from the switching frequency of the regulator IC. So if you remember, the, the regulator of the IC has about a 1.5 megahertz switching frequency. And my markers on these two spikes show that we get about 1.4 megahertz, right? So you can see these spikes are not continuous. So in some cases they bleed through and in some cases they don't, but these are directly related to the switching frequency. So these noise type levels are pretty standard for switching regulators. To get noise lower, you can always add more and more output capacitance. You can also play with your inductance value. To reduce the ripple, you want a lower inductance value, but you need to be careful because you want to have enough inductance so your design works properly and you have a stable output. So there's sort of a trade-off when playing with the inductor value, but you can always add more capacitors. That'll just add more cost to your design. For getting rid of high frequency noise, you can always add what's called a ferrite bead, which is a sort of a high frequency attenuator. But just remember, you're never going to get rid of all the noise. Switch-based regulators are always going to have some outside, out, output noise. That's the downside of using them. Okay, then as I mentioned, I wanted to share the bomb. So this is the bomb for all the circuits that we covered. I'm not going to stay on here forever and cover each part. You can take a screenshot of it. The PCB that I used, the specs for the PCB, it was just a two-layer PCB, a top and a bottom layer. I used FR40 material, which is pretty standard. Okay, that's it for part four. I hope you enjoyed the series. I enjoyed putting it together. If you have any questions or comments related to this video series, please use the comment section below. And if you're interested to hang around, let's look at my Patreon page and what you can get there. Okay, here I'm sharing you my first post on my Patreon page, and it's related to what I was just talking about. So the post on this Patreon page contains a video that goes over the rest of this ESP32 development board design that hasn't been covered in the USB Type-C connector video, the uh, configuring programming circuits for ESP32 module, and then of course the uh, build a lithium ion and USB power design with charging. So all of those videos show parts of this design. So this video that can only be found on my Patreon page covers the rest of the design. The other thing you can get from this Patreon page is the bomb for the whole development board, as well as my PCB design files for Eagle Software, as well as my Gerber and Drill assembly and assembly files that allow you to use them to take this design to a PCB manufacturer and get it made yourself. So all those boards are yours if you join my Patreon page. And so the cost to join is only $3 a month. And my goal here is not to get rich. Uh, the whole goal of using Patreon is, you know, YouTube really doesn't pay much money for ads. So the goal of this is really to help me pay for the materials I use for my videos and to pay to compensate me a little bit for my time. I'm definitely not going to get rich off this. I promise you that. One thing this Patreon page is not for, though, is it's for interacting with questions related to the post and the design cover. But I'm not going to give out design advice on the Patreon page. Sometimes in my YouTube comments, someone will be like, how do I design this, that, and this? And it's like, well, for me to tell you that would require hours and hours and hours of work on my part. So I just want to be clear what you get from my Patreon page. You don't get free design consulting. You just get extra material from my posts and extra design material that you're free to use and modify however you want. All right. Well, thank you and hope to see you on my Patreon page.